Maryland. Here are my credentials. I'll dictate a right to the key. All right, mister. Special. Daily record. Underwood, Maryland. By Nicholas Ransom. Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. December 17th, 1903. This little town nestled among the sand dunes is in an uproar tonight. If there's no uproar when I get out of here, I'll make one. For near here today, two brothers from Dayton, Ohio, named Wilbur and Orville Wright, presented mankind with a nice, new, shiny pair of wings. Hiram, I want to congratulate you for being an editor with courage and foresight. You were the only newspaper in the whole world with a reporter at Kitty Hawk. Think of it. The first man carrying powered flight in history. They've been waiting 20 centuries for this. Why? So you didn't print it. The greatest story since Robert Fulton sailed his steamboat down the Hudson River. The flying machine has arrived. It's here. It's going to change travel and time and customs and war and nations. For once in your life, you had the chance to be first with the latest, and you muffed it. Well, this finishes me with the newspaper business. I'm through. Someday when you're standing on the ground looking up at me, you better keep your mouth closed or I'll drop an oil can in it. Martha! Martha, I've got it. I know how now. You know how to what, Nick? To fly. Oh, did those Wright brothers get off the ground? Twelve feet and they flew 40 yards under perfect control. Daddy, are you really going to fly right away? Well, tomorrow or the next day. Martha, you know how they do it? They walk the wings to get lateral balance. Of course, dear. Why couldn't I have thought of that? Come on, Peggy, we've got to get to work. Daddy, the box cut's almost done. Peggy, Don't you have to go back to the paper this afternoon, Nick? No, I quit. Oh. Martha, flying's going to be a great business, and I'll be in on the ground floor. I can start at the bottom and fly up. Come on, Peggy. Peggy. up about 300 feet with me. Why don't you do a little work instead of sitting around talking so big? I have been working. You have not. Well, you're almost finished. There wouldn't be enough for me to do now. Here's the needle and thread you wanted, Patrick. Don't call me Patrick. I'm sorry, Pat. Give it a scum. Gee, you look nice, Patrick. Pat? Oh, stop it. You always look so nice. How many shirts have you got? I don't know. You wear a clean one every day, don't you? Not if I can help it. Hey, Scott, I don't see why you made that kite so big. Doubling the size doesn't double the lifting power. Why? I don't know. Nobody's explained that yet, but it just doesn't. It ought to cost the ground in a high wind. Well, I wouldn't worry about that unless you're in it. Do you think you'll be able to beat the Wright Brothers record, Mr. Hanson? I ought to be able to knock it into a cocktail. They started off the ground. I'm going to use the cliff near the old stone quarry. Let's get back to work, Scott. Peggy, don't you ever play with dolls anymore the way other little girls do? No, I think flying machines are a lot more fun. Well, I'll bet you're the first aerial tomboy this town ever had. She knows so much, we might as well let her help on our rope. All right, come on. Straighten that out. There's plenty of wind, Scotty. Let's get started. What? Dry. He won't get hurt, will he? Nah, save your breath for running. Come on! What's the matter? Well, I don't know. Maybe you better try. 
quiet. You're lighter than me. I'm sorry you couldn't get up, Pat. You should be first anyway. I didn't do much work on it. Can I talk now? No! For it, that's all. We weighed about half as much. Say, Scott! Listen, you've been so nice about helping us, we're going to do you a big favor. I, I didn't help much. Yes, you did. So we're going to let you be the first to go up in it. I, I like pulling on the rope. It's fun. You're not afraid, are you? Oh, no. But, but you didn't even want me to come out here. Why, Peggy, whatever gave you that idea? Just step right in. Gee, you're going to have a lot of fun in a minute or two. I I don't care about going a long ways up. I, I've got to get home early. Go on, before she changes her mind. All ready, Peggy? He, yes! They're the worst little boys in town, aren't they, Mommy? That's exactly what I told their folks. Keep that in your eye until I get back. Mommy, are we going to eat this steak later? Probably. Peggy, Pat's father just called me. He said you were flying in that kite this afternoon. Is that true? Yes, Mommy. Were... Were you up 40 feet? Yes, Mommy. Are you mad at me, Daddy? 
course not, darling. I feel better now. Peggy, you're the only little girl we've got. If something happened to I you... didn't want to go up very high. I told him I had to get home early. You don't want me to be gray-haired, do you? Oh, no. Never. Well, maybe I never will be if I don't have to worry anymore about you flying around in kites. I won't ever again. But you better not fly either. You're the only daddy we've got. Huh. This is different. This is an airplane, not a flimsy kite. Besides, I'm older than you are. When you grow up, maybe you can fly too. With you? I hope so. You better get back to bed, Miss Ranson. Good night, Daddy. Good night, darling. Hey, Peggy. Yes, Daddy. How did it feel when you were up there in the air? smile or else I'll start getting scared. That's better. Goodbye, Peggy. I'll send you a Christmas present from Holland. Goodbye, Daddy. Good luck, Nick. crash to turn off the ignition. <laughs> seem right without him here explaining things. Peggy? Y yes? Do, do you think he'd mind if we each took one of his models to, to sort of remember him by? No. <laughs> you keep this one, Peggy. It's the real one.
The first airplane flight was made in 1903. It lasted much less than a minute, and the altitude attained was about 12 feet. Today, airplanes are staying up for hours, ascending to altitudes as high as 11,000 feet, traveling great distances. 20 miles an hour was once a good speed. Today, machines are approaching the speed of 100 miles an hour. Santos Dumont has made the first flight in Europe. Blériot has flown the English Channel. Louis Paulin has flown cross-country from London to Manchester. Eugene Ely has landed and taken off from the deck of a battleship. Glenn Curtis has proved the ability of the seaplane. C.P. Rogers has spanned our continent in his airplane. And how long did that take, Mr. Lang? Well, uh, 50 days, to be exact. The train takes four days. <laughs> Gentlemen, I don't hesitate to predict that the time will come when a machine will travel in non-stop flight from New York to Chicago. Oh, here, here, here. Germany has 600 airplanes. France has almost as many. England has nearly 90. Italy is appropriating millions of lire to build up an air force. Even little Belgium has 20 machines. A war abroad is undoubtedly near. Who can say whether our isolation policy will keep us out of a world conflict? I understand our army has some very good machines. Our army has about 25 patched up relics. It has 11 experienced flyers. Are we getting soft and decadent? Our young men seem to be content with what they have. The air should be a challenge to them. But the spirit of adventure, of courage, of great risk in the unknown is gone from them. Gentlemen, is the pioneer spirit dead in America? Don't let the pressure drop. How much longer have I got to do this? Well, I'll be finished in a little while. Tomorrow we'll assemble it. Then I can fly a day after tomorrow, huh? Sure. But we'll fly. Don't worry about that. You told us not to worry twice before. We stayed right on the ground twice before. Yeah, well, I'll quit guessing. I can tell you exactly what this ship will do. No, don't tell us. I want to see it. <laughs> well, what's so funny about that? Be like... Well, like looking at the back of a book to see how it ended. And this might be the kind of a book you wouldn't want to see the end of, like your father's. I'm sorry, Peggy. I didn't mean to say that. I'm all right. I wish you were here to see it. So do I. He'd be having more fun than any of us. Say, we sure talk a lot of flying. You remember what Wilbur Wright said, don't you? The parrot, the bird that talks the most, flies the least. Well, listen, the pioneers like Mr. Ranson had to die to learn what we can learn in that wind tunnel. And anything that little fellow will do over there, this one will do in the air. still better when she's wide open? Nah, it's tight as a drum now.
96 miles an hour. Listen, we can break the world speed record with this ship. We have broken it! Woohoo! <laughs> hey, hey! Oh, I'm sorry. Nolan's my name, J.A. Nolan. Nolan? The Nolan? The airplane Nolan? That's right. Say, I've seen your planes up in Nassau Junction. Uh, my name's Scott Barnes. How do you do? This is Miss Ranson. How do you do? And Mr. Falconer. Hi. Mr. Falconer, I want to talk to you about your plane. Oh, you'd better talk to him. He builds them. I fly them first. Where did you get the idea for that fuselage, that motor car? Oh, I sort of worked it out. Oh, he knows everything. He had a year at MIT. Look here, Mr. Barnes. How would you like to go to work for me, designing planes? Hi, oh, I... I Good, uh, you're hired. Do you mind letting me have those goggles? Uh, no. Say, what about Pat, uh, Mr. Falconer? All right, he's hired. You want a job? No, sir. Look me up if you do. Mind if I try it? Well, no. No. Say, Mr. Nolan, how'd you happen to hear about us? I didn't. I was driving along, heard an airplane motor. I looked up and saw your plane. I said to myself, Nolan, you've got to cut out that drinking. There's no airplanes like that yet. Switch on. story for you. Today, Underwood had the honor conferred upon it of being the home of the fastest airplane in the world. How fast it go? 96 miles an hour. <laughs> My boy, I'm proud of you. <laughs> A good reporter, Scott, goes out and makes his own stories. Hey, I'm sorry to interrupt you like then this. Then keep your mouth case. shut. I'll get out and write that story. Yes, sir. I'll write my resignation at the same time. And make... Huh? I got a job with J.A. Nolan, the airplane manufacturer. So have I. Hmm. Well, I... I never was much of a newspaper man, Uncle Hiram. It might have been if you'd ever been on a newspaper. Well, I won't stand your way, Scott. Oh, thanks. I, I'll go out and write that story. I'll write it myself. You resign. You going to? My part of it's over, I guess. Well, you'll have to start learning to cook now. I'm afraid so. Well, what do you hang around here for? You ain't in the newspaper business. How much time we got for a good press? Twenty minutes. We gotta bust up the front page. Why? The Archduke Ferdinand has just been assassinated at Sarajevo. You have a family? It might mean war. Oh, get out, get out. Do you mean to sit there and tell me that you're not gonna print it? That's exactly what I mean. The record circulates in Underwood, not Serbia. I'm writing the story of the fastest aeroplane in the world, made by three Underwood citizens. That's news. Wait. I'm getting the headline. I'm getting it. I'm getting it. I got it. Local boy breaks speed record in airplane built by local boy. Hey, where'd you ever get the idea for a wing like that? Went out and took a look at a steel bridge. That's the sort of construction we need. Yeah, I guess you're right, but I ain't seen anybody flying around here in the bridge lately. You'd think a guy could learn to paint slower than that in a year. Parker, I think you got a spot on your clothes. <coughs> Baker, I think you've got a spot on your nose. Why? You're fired, Faulkner. I'm going to throw you out myself. Hey, stop that. Hey, what's going on here? Why, I criticized Faulkner's work, Mr. Nolan, and he hit me. You're through, Faulkner. That goes for me, too. Me, too. 
Now listen, Scott, I don't want to lose you. Forget the whole thing. I'll take Falcon back. No, you won't. Thanks, no. But listen, boy. Now listen. Look, Scotty, this is my fight. After we get out of here, you'll be sorry, and I won't. I've got to have a little excitement in my life, and I can't get it in any airplane factory. I'd rather take them apart in the air than put them together on the ground. See? Yeah, I see. So long, Joe. So long! I'll stay. said goodbye to anybody else. I don't know how to say goodbye to you. Uh, where are you going? To France. No. Oh, don't go. Why don't you talk to Scotty before you go? It wouldn't do any good. I I've got to get out of here. This is a funny way to be saying goodbye, isn't it? Hiding and everything like those. Escaping from prison. Maybe that's what it is. There's nothing really so important about this, is it? Seems like it to me. Right now. Would you care if I kissed you? I'd care if you didn't. Goodbye, Maggie. Goodbye, Pat. Don't go away. mother just died of a heart attack. You didn't think we ought to run an extra high? No. About the war, I mean. I don't know. War has been spoiled for me now.
Remember, Peggy, she's gone to glory. That ought to comfort you. Thank you, Mrs. Hill. Oh, how frightened I'd be, Scott. If I were ever in trouble or worried, and, and I looked around, and, and you weren't there. I'll always be around, bothering you. You don't bother me. No, I guess I don't. Wish I did. A letter from Pat this morning. Is, is he all right? Is he? Just got his third German. Why, that's wonderful. It is wonderful, isn't it? Sure it is. If Pat hadn't gotten him, he'd have gotten Pat. You're very proud of him, aren't you? Oh, I brag a little. Why don't you ever brag about yourself? Well, there's nothing to... Oh, but there is. The, well, the airplane you built for Mr. Nolan. The government taking you in the army right away and making you an officer. Well, that's really nothing, Peggy. You see, they make everybody an officer in the air service. Well, nearly everybody. Everybody that can fly, that is. See? Yes, I see. I see a lot of things. There are two of you. One stays and does important things and cares. And the other goes away and, and doesn't care. And I'm all wrong. I can't help it. No one's ever wrong about things like that. Scott. I wish you bothered me. I wish it so much. You know, Peggy, when we made our mistake was in growing up.
to see you. Back a minute. Yeah. got a few minutes between trains, but... Oh, I had to come up and say goodbye to you. I'm going over with the unit of telephone operator. Well, this is rather sudden. Well, I have a job, but there's nothing to keep me at home now. No, I... Oh, how's the ship coming? Oh, fine, fine. Gee, you should probably get to see Pat. I hope so. Will you give him my love? I will. I'll, I'll miss you, Peggy. Will you please write? Of course. Any road against an officer kissing her. A private goodbye? Well, I, I got grease on my face. I don't care. Thanks. Okay, buddy. It, it seems like the whole world's saying goodbye now, doesn't it? Yes. I do for you this time of night. Major, as soon as I test the new ship and get it passed, I'd like to be assigned to service in France. What? I'm sorry if this seems sudden, sir. You lost your mind? No, sir. Well, you sound like it. For every 10,000 fighting pilots, we have one man with your technical ability. What's your reason? Well, it's a private matter, sir. And your agreement with your country is a public matter. Yes, sir. <laughs> to transfer him, getting this plane so it'll stand anything, and to keep from getting killed. Getting, getting what? Oh, I'm getting so I talk too much. It's a shame the parachute hasn't been developed for aeroplanes. He's going to need one in a minute. In a minute? He's been needing one all his life. Got the hiccups, you know. He better be awful good, or the next suit he wears won't have no pockets in it. My legs are broken. The section of the leading edge peeled off. Well, let me see if I can't. Listen, get listen, I can't talk much. Reinforce the under part of the leading edge with plywood. Okay, Lieutenant. Is the ship cracked up bad? Well, it's got a few scratches on it. Here, give me a hand, will you, buddy? And hey, listen, work on it yourself. Don't let anybody else try it. All right. Uh, give me. Hold him up. 
Pat would have brought it in for a three-point landing without any wings. You brought her in, you just did it kind of sudden like that's all. Look at that. All right, now take a hold of it. Any telegrams for me? There's nothing yet, Miss Ramson. Hello? Young Women's Christian Association. Peggy, why don't you go with us tonight? I'm sure Jimmy can handle two girls for a few hours. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, no, thanks, really. You're crazy to wait for an aviator, Peggy. They're harder to get than generals. Are you sure there are no telegrams for me? Really sure. Hey, soldier! That! You glad to see me? Glad I. Well, I can't cry in this lobby. <laughs> I can't either. Let's go somewhere where we can, huh? Well, come on. <laughs> feet high. It's clean and cold and mysterious, and the dead never lie on it, and there's no mud. And the clouds are there like big feather beds to hide in, and the stars are your infantry. You're never afraid, are you? No. Are you? Afraid of being alone? Afraid of being unhappy? I was afraid of one thing. That's what we're doing. What? That I'd never see you again. Well, I'm glad you said that. Why? Because... I haven't got anything to be afraid of now. I wonder what Scotty's doing today. He sent you his love. What about him? I brought mine. Come in. How are you feeling, Lieutenant? Ah, bored stiff. How's the ship? Oh, as well as could be expected. Here. I don't want any flowers. I want to know about the ship. Well, it's sort of finished. What do you mean, sort of? Well, more or less. Say, cut that out, will you? Quit stalling. What's wrong? Oh, nothing much. Then why aren't you out there working on it instead of being here with a bunch of daisies in your hand like a daffy schoolgirl? Well, because they got it on the line warming it up, and Lieutenant Blake's going to fly it in an hour. Got a knife? Yeah, but I ain't going to let you cut your throat. Cut me loose from here. Oh, but Lieutenant... Listen to me. I'm your superior officer. Obey orders. Yes, sir. No. Oh! Ready? Yeah. Now, get me a coat and my helmet and goggles out of there. Oh. Oh. <laughs> hey, hey, where's your pants? I can't get them on over the cast. Come on, camera in your back. Get moving. Oh. Lieutenant, I'll never forgive myself if anything happens to you. What's the matter with you? Are you nuts? I guess so. I joined the army. Get out of the way! We're gonna fly it out! Oh! Hold the jocks! 
to make a guy conservative. I'm away to New York. Why, ain't you through with the Army? Not for a while. They transferred me to the airmail run between New York and Washington. <laughs> well, I'd rather be a newspaper man than a mailman, but it gives us a story anyway. Give me a couple of columns on that for tomorrow with a local angle. I got a local boy to fly airmen. <laughs> well, sit down, sit down, Scott. Hi, I haven't had a good look at you for a year. <laughs> Can you stay overnight? One night won't even get us started in a good checker game. I got a week's leave. That's fine. That'll make about 50 games you lose. <laughs> Mary! Ha! They just came in. Oh. Tack and Peggy, they were married in Paris. What do you mean? What's the matter? That's swell. I gotta go work on that uh, airmail story. I, I sort of thought you had the inside track when Pat went away. Women don't usually forgive being left behind. Not Peggy. She'd forgive him anything in the world. Except not loving her. Well, it's beginning to look like the mail on this run is coming by train. Brother, I raised this pilot from a pup. The mail he carries comes by air. I haven't seen Scotty in three years, and tonight he's late. I don't care how late he is, as long as he gets in. Ceiling here is 500 feet. Visibility half a mile. Number three overdue and still unreported. Right. Barnes is flying number three, isn't he? Yeah. He came down to Trenton with a broken oil line. I tried to hold him, but he taped it up and decided to come on in. Say, you're Patrick Falconer, aren't you? That's right. I've heard so much about you. Read a lot about you, too. Here he is now. Excuse me. Oh, give me Washington. You have a nice trip? Oh, lovely. Nothing like a hot oil bath for cold nights. Hello, dirty face. Pat! Now I know why I wanted to come in tonight. How are you? <laughs> Great, Scotty. Remember me, Scott? Could I ever forget? How are you, Joe? Better off than most pilots. Hello, Mr. Gibbs. Hey. Who, me? Uh -huh. Hello, <laughs> Mrs. Faulkner. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry to hear about your father's death, Pat. That's what brought us back from Europe. What are you going to do now? Oh, I don't know. Buy a string of polo ponies or something. The world seems to be getting rather flat. And I can't make the world round for him anymore. <laughs> 
My wife wants to divorce me, but she can't because she has to present me with a son first. No! Yeah. And if it isn't a son, I'm afraid he's going to divorce me. <laughs> It'll be a son. It'll be great anyway. Lieutenant Parker? Yes? We're newspaper men, Lieutenant. It's quite a break catching at the airmail field. Going in the airmail? No, I just came out to This see... type of flying's too tame for you, huh? Well, it's a little out of my line. You're not through with flying, are you, Lieutenant? There's none of my brand in the United States, unless you count barnstorming and... Can't go marry a Jenny now, it'd be big of me. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get a picture in front of a mail plane. Swell idea. Right over here, please. You too, Mrs. Faulkner. Do you mind getting out of the picture, buddy? No, not at all. Thanks. All right, folks, a big smile. Look at your husband, Mrs. Faulkner. Thank you. One more, please. Now, looking at the plane. Here, let me do it. That's all dirty. Oh, the mother Gibbs. All right. Hey, look at the ace. Bert, Golden, how are you? It's great to see you again. Great to see you. Sit down, have a drink. Thanks. <laughs> hey, how long has it been since I've seen you two reprobates? Uh, bourbon and soda. Bourbon and soda, yes. Last time was in the champagne. Remember when you used to come over and land at our field all the time? <laughs> yeah, claiming you was lost because we had beer on ice. That's right. <laughs> What brings you to New York? Thought you lived in some whistle stop in Maryland. No, not anymore. I'm living out in Long Island now. I uh, came in town on business today. I hear you're very rich. Well, I'm eating often. <laughs> Same thing all around again. Yes, sir. What are you boys up to? We just found ourselves a war in Morocco. Yeah? Not a yeah. very big war, Pat, but better than nothing. Yeah, we're going over to fly in it, but uh, you wouldn't be interested in uh, being rich. Oh, yes, I would. No, I wouldn't. I'm married. You mean you'd let a marriage interfere with a fairly good war? Well, no, but uh, I'm having a son tonight or tomorrow. Well, what do you think of that? A son. To Pat Jr., gentlemen, may he be the flyer his father was. These fathers, they're more trouble than the mothers. Oh, the babies. Peggy. I knew you'd come. Scotty, where is he? I'll find him. What if he's been hurt? He hasn't been hurt. You quit thinking about things like that. I wouldn't have phoned, but... but it, it's so hard being alone now. You're not alone. Thank you. see Mrs. Hilton now. She's having... I don't want to see. Just knocking on wood. For luck. Is that my baby? Oh, no. Your baby's much too young to be on the milk wagon. I did have a baby, didn't I? Of course. Shall I prove it to you? Oh. Please do. Nurse. Mister. Miss. Baby. 
how can I be this happy? That's why there are so many mothers. Peggy, I was going to write you a letter and then go out and hang myself. I thought maybe you'd want to see me once more. At least once more. I... I honestly didn't mean to do it, Peggy. I met some of the fellows I used to fly with, and we got a little... Let's not talk about it now. We're together again. All three of us. Pat. Meet Pat. Pat? You mean... Short for Patricia. Patricia was the closest I could come to Patrick. Oh, she's beautiful. She's probably the most beautiful girl that ever lived. Except her mother. Lieutenant Commander Reed just landed the NC-4 in Portugal. First airplane flight across the Atlantic. Daily record has a bigger flight than that to play up. <laughs> Who made it? The stork. Just brought a baby girl, a Pat and Peggy. Well, congratulations. I mean, that's really something. Uh, we just gotta get married and have a family. I hate to think of spending my old age with you. Maybe we ought to get married. Get out. I'll do the story. Just say a baby was born to them. And give its wings spread, ready to climb, and horsepower. Uh, yeah, I know, horsepower. Hello, oh, Pat. Hello, Scotty. Scotty, I've got to get out of this town. The night Patricia was born, I got drunk with some friends who were going over to fly with the French in Morocco. I signed up to go with them. I can't breathe here anymore. It's driving me mad, sitting around, sleeping with my eyes open. You can't understand, Scotty. You've never had that ache inside of you. You're satisfied. As God is my judge, I wish I were. I've got to go. I know I'm wrong, so far wrong, I shouldn't even try to argue about it. I'd give anything to know you understood, Scotty. And then you could make Peggy understand. Nobody who's been through a war can come home and forget, like turning off a light. The boat sails tonight. I'd say goodbye to Peggy and Patricia, but if I tried, I wouldn't go. I've got to go. When the motor's making me deaf again and the propeller's blowing the hair off my head and I can smell that funny stink of burning castor oil and see some big blue mountains to climb over, then I'll be happy again. Will you look after Peggy and Patricia for me till I get back? You know I will. Goodbye, dirty face. He's gone, hasn't he? Where? To Morocco.
I knew it was coming. But so soon. He'll be back. Oh, yes. Yes, he'll be back. I think I understand. He, he's got something inside of him. He's got to kill it, wear it out. I knew he was restless and unhappy. I knew Patty was a disappointment to him. Well, I'm so glad he didn't say goodbye to me. I'd have cried and begged him to stay and acted like a fool. But Scotty, I was so happy for a while. It was like... Like being in heaven, just to be with him. I wish you were hearing this instead of me. Oh, he'd have stayed and done his duty if I'd have asked him. But he wasn't made to do his duty. It's funny. I'd rather have him for only a little while than any other man for a lifetime. Well, Scotty, don't you ever leave me. Because I'll always be in trouble, and if... If I turned around and you weren't there... I'll be there. Well, we'll talk some more, or play some cards, or... You... You're wonderful. No, no. You're wonderful. Taking it so well. I was ready for it. I'll just have to wait to have a vacation in my life if he comes back. Well, if he isn't cured the next time I see him, I'm going to work on him with a baseball bat. That's a promise. I'll call you in the morning. Will you go to bed now? Just as soon as Patty's bed. Will you have dinner tomorrow night and the show? I'd love it. That's a date. Good night. Good night. Hey, Joe, you asleep? Uh-uh. I was just laying here thinking how nice it was of you to let me bunk here till I get over the effects of my last crap game. Well, you were thinking pretty loud. Want a cigarette? Uh-huh. Thanks. Pat is tonight. Well, wherever he is, I'll bet he's in a flat spin, either personal or aerial. Seems to get what he wants. Yeah, medals. Somebody's got to fly the mail, Lieutenant. <laughs> you know, things don't work out so good sometimes, do they? They'll work out all right. Oh, I don't mean aeroplanes. I do. You know, this place ain't exactly a home. Not that I don't like it now. Well, you can get used to pretending it is. Well, it needs a... Well, what it needs is a wife. Say, you never listen to your own advice, do you? Well, I'd like to get married. Trouble is, nobody will marry me. Well, you know, worse off than I am. You know, I always thought guys got what was coming to them. But if Pat got what was coming to him, it wouldn't be her. Hey, Hiram, here's something we can spread all over the front page tonight. They've just completed the first run of the Transcontinental Airmail, New York to San Francisco. No. But this is history, Hiram. They've been, been carrying, carrying the mail across, across the continent in trains for years. This is planes, not trains. 
Trains don't fly. It saves time. It helps business. Just a minute. I got a story here about Pat Falconer. He just ended a war in Morocco, single-handed. Blew up a well and caused a whole tribe to surrender. Tribes are always surrendering. He's a local boy. He's wounded. He may lose his leg. That's news. A local boy just flew the first stage of the transcontinental airmail I was telling you about. Your own nephew. I won't let family sentiment interfere with the conduct of this newspaper. No, and her brains either. That's enough. Have the printer set up that headline. Local boy makes good in Morocco. Yeah, local boy makes good in Morocco. Peggy. Peggy, darling. Gee, she's getting big. She weighs 26 pounds. Could I hold her? Of course. I can't be this happy. Not after what I've done. Oh, I'm so glad you're back. It doesn't matter where you went or why. Just that you're back again. Does your leg hurt? Only when I stand on it too long. You were so vague in your letters. Well, they were talking about taking it off. That's why I couldn't tell you when I was coming home. That's the sound I heard the night you went away. Somebody's in that plane that you know. Scotty? Every night he flies over. Since you've been gone, he does that. To remind me that he's looking after things for you. Sarcasm. I know who's really running this joint. Will it fly? Fly the wings off anything in the air now. Come on, I'll go over the specifications with you. Oh, no, you won't. I don't understand that stuff. I'll wait till you get it finished, and then I'll fly it. Would you mind initialing these plans so we can start construction? You're still the president, you know. Not a very interesting job, either. Say, uh, your old complaint isn't coming back again, is it? A uh, little. I've been a good boy for five years now. Well, don't tip over the apple cart, Pat. 
They're uh, getting interested again in Raymond Norteague's $25,000 prize for a non-stop flight across the Atlantic. If you installed extra wing tanks in this ship and uh, put in fuselage tanks, what would be the maximum cruising range? About 4,000 miles, but I know what you're thinking and the answer is no. Why? Because instruments are the thing now, Pat. I always got by. Yeah, then, but not now. Now listen, Pat. A long-range flight like the one you're talking about ought to be a definite contribution to aviation. With you, it's just a stunt. Scotty, suppose you took about three months and taught me to fly your way. Then would you build that ship for me? Will you listen to teacher? I'll guarantee to get a gold star on my report card every week. You're practically in Paris. It's Peggy. Don't ask me to tell her about this. Oh, wait a minute. You can at least back me up. I hope you're convincing. I always am. Gentlemen. Hello. Hello, Peggy. Uh, Peggy, uh, you remember where we got married? Did we? Oh, yes. Oh, well, let's see. Uh, ah, Paris. That's right. That's where I'm going. In an airplane. What? Scotty's going to build me one like this. And Mr. Ortiz's going to pay me $25,000 for going over nonstop. Of course, he doesn't know it yet, but... Uh, you don't mind, do you? Of course not. I... Well, I'll still be very proud of my husband, even after he flies the Atlantic. Joy, you satisfied? With the ship? Yeah. How do you do in the soup? Oh, sort of all right. That isn't what I asked you. I'll bet I'm the first stool pigeon that ever really flew. Did he go on instruments? Well, you could call it that. Pretty near. Every time we eased up into the stuff, why, we spun out. After a while, I says, where are we? He says, over Los Angeles, or maybe it's San Francisco. So we went downstairs to take a look. Now, what happened? A cow had to lay down to get out of the way. Go on. Well, then we went up to fly blind. And when that guy flies blind, he flies blind. Got so I couldn't stay in my seat. And I says, either I'm getting nervous or this plane is upside down. It was. How'd you get in? I still don't know. I had nine last letters wrote to my mother when he sees an empty space and says, I'm getting bored. I think I'll set it down here. And we was both very surprised when it turned out to be our own field. Hey! Hiya, Scotty. I'll see you later. They Just a minute. Office. Funny face, I want to talk to you. Hey, is that any way to address the president? Now listen, Patch, you got a bear down on instrument flying. I got home, didn't I? Well, they don't have railroads over the North Atlantic. I'll always find a hole in the soup someplace. I've got homing pigeon blood in me. <laughs> well, sweetheart, it's your neck. Oh, don't get sore. It's a very pretty neck, and nobody'd admire it if I didn't stick it out once in a while. <laughs> Hold it, please! How about a shot up by the plane, guys? Yeah, in one minute, peer it out. You know, like a jack-in-the-box. I'm sorry, boys, that's all I've got time for. Well, any final statement, Captain? Yeah, goodbye. Here's the final weather reports, Mr. Falconer, and a telegram from Mr. Bond in New York. Oh, it's from Scott. They're ready in New York. Everything ready here. Stop. Keep your eyes on that instrument board. Stop. All the luck, Scott. God bless him. Stay sweet, Mr. Falconer! What will be your time, Captain? 20 hours. I'll be in New York at 4.30 in the morning. Well, Peggy, I guess this is it. We've had a funny life, haven't we? I was saying goodbye. But uh, never so publicly before. I'll bring you something pretty when I come back. I just want you, Dick.
Ten to five, he's overdue. Probably Buck in the headwind. Well, he was on his course all right when he went over Columbus. I wish you'd hurry up and get in here. I'd like to work on that crate. That's his motor. He's overshot the field. He's heading out to sea. Warm up the amphibian. I get permission to use it. I know it'd be you or nobody. Thanks.
Hello there. Peggy, Patty. Well, I hope this place doesn't get you down. It's funny, I was thinking the same thing about you. Mother, I'm going over to talk to Joe. All right, darling. When we drove up, we saw one open hangar marked with your name. What does that mean? Well, it means I'm still trying. I rented the hangar from Pat's creditors. I'm going to try to design a bomber for the Army. You need money. <laughs> None of yours. This is a gamble. Do you remember that I helped to build the first plane that you ever made that flew? I'm sorry. We'll talk it over with Pat. It's too late. What do you mean? Dad went away to China last night. Gee, that's tough. What'd he go for? Guess he just couldn't stand it sitting around home after losing everything. Yeah, that's right. Here. Thanks. Bye, Patty. Hey, Joe! You want a job where you won't get paid very often? Sure, gee, I thought for a minute you'd forgotten me, boss. Well, I think everything's about right. You better lower the cowl and make the windshield bigger. Why? Oh, I hear the Army likes to see where it's going. Where did you ever get your information on the Army? I got the bonus, didn't I? Scotty. Yeah? Could I speak to you for a minute? With pleasure. I've added and subtracted everything ten times, but we've still only got enough money to buy one motor, not including its propeller. Did we borrow back the wages we paid to Joe? Two weeks ago. Look, it's Hiram and Hank. Well, well, look who's here. Oh, how are you? Hello, Hank. Hey, Peggy. Hey. How are you? Well, how are you? <laughs> Gee, I was glad to see you, Uncle Hiram. You too, Hank. I reckon you'll be glad in a minute. What brings you out of California? Uh, we heard you were in a fix. So we came out to put some money in your flying machine. Oh, no, no. I, I can't take your money. You got to. I sold out the newspaper. What? Uh, no future in it. Not the way he run it, anyway. I... I think I want to kiss somebody. Well, I'm in this, too, you know. Of course, Hiram never paid me more than enough to keep a skunk alive, but I got a little saved up. <clears throat> yeah, Peggy. Hank, I, I... I don't know what to say. No, you ought to. You're the boss. Where do I start in? Uh, Peggy, do you mind not telling Scott you got us to put in with him? Then I'll always uh, sort of be his favorite uncle. Of course. Patty. Yes? We got an angel. understand your bomber is capable of 200 miles per hour? Yes, sir. You mean it's 40 miles an hour faster than my pursuit ships? Yes, sir. We'll get in formation and stay even with you till we pass the first pylon. After that, you'd better pour the coal on that freight car of yours because we're going to be leaving. Pour it to it. You think I won't? You'd better. Okay. Okay, I've given them motors 21 joule movements, 
Them pursuit guys will think they're in captive balloons. Come on, Uncle Hiram. No fool like an old fool. Well, I'm going to die in a little while anyway. So I might as well let Scott kill me. Pay a bunch of doctors to do it. the one military airplane in the world today. It's made every other ship of every other nation obsolete from this minute on. And it's going to force us to cancel millions of dollars for the contracts already made. It's the first time that airplanes have been made obsolete before they were built. successful patrol today. I lost four men. You know, sometimes I think flying is dangerous. Well, I'm through. Yeah, we all are. We're old men and flying's for kids. Tomorrow, next day, next week, somebody gets on our tail and curtains. Not me. I'm going home. What'd you say? I'm running out on you guys. Yeah, you come running back. You always did. Remember Morocco? Yeah, I remember. But I've got a wife and a daughter who's big enough now to, to be stopped from marrying a flyer. I'm going home and stay home this time. Listen, the only home you'll ever have will be six feet of earth with a broken propeller blade stuck at the head of it. Your name on it, maybe. Everybody up! There's a group of bombers coming over. Hey. Well, this is the last time. isn't he? Yes.
postcard. I wanted to see him once again. I know. You won't want to go tonight, now? Tonight, more than ever. We are gathered here tonight to celebrate the fifth birthday of the finest military airplane in the world, the Faulkner Bomber, and to convey our thanks and respects to the little group of pioneers who made it possible. The honor of presenting the leader of this group, the man from whose brain, courage, and ability the Faulkner airplanes originate, does not rightfully belong to me. But we have with us tonight a man who is a member of that inner circle, a real airman, the aerial godfather, so to speak, of Scott Barnes. To him, I surrender the honor of this next introduction. Major General Thomas Hadley, United States Army, retired. Mr. Alcott, ladies and gentlemen, you are here to celebrate the fifth anniversary of the Faulkner airplanes. I am here to celebrate the 19th anniversary of my confidence in a man who knew how to grow his own wings. I think the ships standing behind me tonight prove that I was right. While we have such men as he with us, we need have no fear of the future. Every week, every month, every year, we are flying faster and farther and higher. And all this progress springs from the dreams and the sweat and the heartbreak of such men as the lieutenant. I once thought seriously of having court-martialed Scott Barnes. General Hadley, ladies and gentlemen, you don't answer a major general back ever. So all I can say is yes, sir, and thank you, sir, from my heart. And now I want to introduce the pioneer of us all. She looks much too young and beautiful for such an introduction. But long before any of us flew, she was up in the air, in pigtails and a kite, testing the first product of Falconer Airplanes Incorporated, May I proudly present Mrs. Patrick Faulkner. There's one man who isn't here tonight. The most important man of all. The man who founded this plant and whose name it bears. The man who put his fortune in it and lost everything. The man who gave us our chance. Patrick Falconer. If he were here tonight, I'm sure he'd be as proud of us as we are of him. And that's the highest tribute we could ever be paid. Thank you. 